I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. For a free month's trial of Treehouse, head on over to teamtreehouse.com slash show. In this episode, we'll be talking about the Chrome DevTools, dynamic heat maps, device mockups, and more. Let's check it out. First up is this really cool article that allows you to change the Chrome DevTools over to a dark theme. Kind of like the Treehouse show. That's right. Bit of a dark theme. Yeah, we, we kind of changed the theme in here. Anyway, if you're looking at the Chrome DevTools all day long, which many of us are, you'll kind of get a little bit fatigued because it's black text on a white background, which can be kind of bright, kind of hard on your eyes. But if you're looking at them all day, you can change it over to this dark theme. And this article shows you exactly how to do that. So step one, enable developer, developer tools experiments. Basically, you just go to Chrome slash flags in your address bar. You enable the developer tools experiments. Then you enable custom UI themes. And this shows you in more detail how to do that. And then you can download a theme. And the theme that they're using here is DevTools theme Zero Dark Matrix. That sounds super cool and hackerish. And then you can install the theme. Is that a candy? Hackerish? By opening your developer tools. And that's it. It's pretty simple and straightforward. And it should give you something that looks just like this. So. Pretty cool. I like using a dark theme in my text editor. So like when I'm using Sublime Text or something like that, I, I do like to keep it on a dark theme. So I'm glad that I can do it in the dev tools now as well. I like to use a dark theme when interacting with Nick. Next up, we have a project called heatmap.js. As you might expect from the name, this is dynamic heat maps for your web pages. Now, what exactly is a heat map? Well, if you look at the right side of the screen here, you can see my mouse pointer. And as I move it along, oh, look at that. We got a little trail. What is happening? And then if I leave it in one place for a little while, it will change color to represent where the mouse pointer is on the screen. And of course, if you try this on the Treehouse show, just the whole screen just turns red. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, like your emotional state. Yeah. Now, um, Heat maps are very, very easy to use. You just, uh, this is version two of the product, so just drop it in. It is very small, only three kilobytes gzipped. You can see there is a heat map displaying right there under the number of kilobytes gzipped. And this also supports 40,000 data points. Uh, it's very, very easy to use. You can see right here, all you do is create a heat map and give it a container. And then you can also use it to set the data. Now, if we look at the documentation, you can see there are not a lot of things that you need to do to get started. You just create it. And you can also register any plugins that you have. Then you can add and set data and also get values and send values. So here are some plugins that you can use. For example, if you want to use it with Google Maps, you can give it a little heat map layer. Oh, in. that's what that is. I thought you could control the weather. No, um, that's going to be version three. This is only version two. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah. Uh, but for right now, you know, if you have data on, let's say, population or I don't know how much ice cream is sold in a certain place, you can put it on the heat map and be good to go. So we'll have a link to that in the show notes, which you can get to at youtube.com slash go treehouse or search for us on iTunes where the treehouse show. And also, don't forget to check us out at teamtreehouse.com slash show for a free month. Yeah, free month of, of Treehouse. Very cool stuff. Well, next up is HTML5 device mockups. This is a GitHub repo. And well, reading is boring, so let's just click on the demo here. Basically, it's a little piece of code, which you can see right here. And you can use this to render a physical device. So for example, here I have an iPhone 5. And of course, Right here, you can actually put your own content. So you could put your own content inside of a screen here and maybe render it. Maybe a screenshot, it. maybe maybe pictures of, of Nick and I. And, and just render it as straight up HTML. So it's pretty cool. You can also do it on an iPad if you want maybe a little 
little bit of a larger view of me and Jason or an iMac. That's that's nice. There's MacBook Pro, uh, several Android devices, Surface, and if you click on devices that have multiple colors, you can actually do it in another color. So there's uh, a different colored iPhone. You can do it in landscape uh, and still change colors. Pretty cool stuff. Now, if we go back to the GitHub repo and you actually click on the device mockups here, you can drill down into any one of these folders and actually see, aha, there is the PNG image of the iMac that we were looking at earlier. So you actually have images of all of these devices, so it's not doing you know any kind of clever CSS styling where it's actually maybe doing a border radius to get the rounded corners here and a gradient on the little stand. No, it's actually just an image. So it renders the image and then you can overlay your own content right onto the screen there. Now, why would you want something like this? Well, maybe you have a web app or an iPhone app that you want to demonstrate and you have a marketing page, like a home page, for example, and you want to just have a nice device there that actually shows the app or something like that, and you can go ahead and use this. So, pretty cool. Some cool features on yeah. there. It maintains the device's aspect ratio when scaled, mm -hmm. and you can bind to the home button for click events if you want to. Right. There is a little JavaScript event on the home button, so if you actually want to have something happen there, maybe something specific, or maybe just like a fun Easter egg or something yeah, like that. Yeah, maybe you get a different picture of, of Nick and myself. That's right. When you click on that. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have the Comprehensive Beginner's Guide to Angular JS. I know that because it is the title of the blog post. Uh, this is a very, very thorough guide, and it can take 33 minutes to read, so get comfortable. I'm going to read this word for word. I'm ready. No, uh, I'm just kidding about that. Not actually going to go through and read this word for word, but this is a wonderful introduction to AngularJS. Now, AngularJS is a great front-end framework from Google that's been getting a lot of headway recently. Now, one thing that I really like about this guide is that it kind of walks you through the quote-unquote old way of creating apps and gives you examples in jQuery of what will happen and how you would start to code a single-page application. Now, it'll show you, hey, okay, I click on this element, and then I go through this API, and look at this, it returns back a list of comments, and then this person creates a div, and more divs for all these comments, and links, and adds attributes, and classes to it, and then appends it to the DOM, and says, hey, this actually looks kind of gross, but this is actually how we coded for a very long time, until these JavaScript web frameworks came along. Now, it discusses the bigger problems that AngularJS starts to solve and then shows you how to refactor everything. So here's an example that we have here. Look at that. I type some test text into this text box right here, and it shows up in this div immediately. Now, what code did that? Well, this is the code that was used to accomplish that. You'll notice it's just a div with an input with this really weird ng model, which is Angular code. And it says it's my text. And then we can just go through and display it in here. So that is the very minimum AngularJS application. Now, as he goes through, it says, OK, let's go on to step two and make the app more complicated. And look at that. Now it supports Markdown. Ooh, so how do we do that? Well, we add a custom filter to our Angular module. Now this walks through and makes the application way, way more enhanced. Uh, like I said, we're not going to go through everything, but it is a wonderful introduction, especially great if you have not used AngularJS yet. So go ahead and check it out. We will have a link in the show notes. Very nice stuff. Well, next up is an article called Enduring CSS writing style sheets for rapidly changing long-lived projects. Uh, an alternate title might have been Immortal CSS. So if you want CSS to live forever, this is a good way to do it. Or Highlander CSS. There can be only one That's right. CSS style sheet. Or, or Vampire CSS. You know, th these are all options for the title. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Basically, uh, this describes how to archi architect your CSS for 
a large scale project that's maybe going to be around for a long time. You might have multiple team members working on it and it's basically going to be a big mess if you don't structure things correctly. Uh, this is a pretty in-depth article. I highly encourage you to read the whole thing, but there's one thing I want to point out here and it's called fun here. And really, you just want to make sure that you have fun when you're coding your CSS. That's, that's pretty much the secret. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> this is an acronym uh, that stands for flat hierarchy of selectors, utility styles, and then namespaced components. So that forms fun right there. It does form fun. So flat hierarchy of selectors is pretty straightforward. It's basically just saying make sure you only use classes or use only classes for selectors except in specific circumstances. Never nest selectors unless it's essential and uh, avoid IDs uh, as much as you possibly can or complete avoidance of IDs as styling hooks. And basically what this is saying is that you only want to make your selectors as specific as you need to make them so that you're not fighting selectors specificity, which is a very difficult word to say, uh, when you are laying on your styles. That also helps with performance uh, with DOM rendering. Yes, it does. It, it's, a, it's a little bit fractional in most cases, but if you do have a really large project, it could start to add up. So that, that is a good point. You can also have utility styles here. And these are basically single responsibility styles. So say, for instance, you have a class called W100. That might be used to set the width of an element to 100%. Or maybe a table class that sets something to display table and table layout fixed. And it says they should have no reliance on other selectors or specific structures. So you just make this one class selector with 100 or W100 and it sets the width to 100%. And by using these and combining these, you can basically create more emergent behavior just by putting these together in different ways. That sounds fun. It is. It's the U in fun. It puts the U in fun uh, literally in this case. Uh, Basically, you want to make sure that these styles are something that you don't modify in any way. So once you add them to the project and they start to get used in various places, it could be very difficult to change that behavior and extract it out later. So make sure that you create these utility classes with the intention of using them the way they're intended to be used and not modifying them or hacking them later on. Uh, the last thing, N, is name spacing components. So or Nick. That, that's right. Put the Nick in fun. Uh, basically. Like the Treehouse show. You want to make sure that you name space your components uh, so you don't have any naming conflicts. Well, what does that mean? Well, maybe you have like a shopping cart component and you also have this other navigation component or something like that. And for whatever reason, you need a wrapper class on both of them. Well, it might be pretty tricky to figure out whether a class is meant for that navigation element or the shopping cart if it's just called wrapper. I mean, what could be even more confusing is if you had like wrapper one and wrapper two or something like that. But here... Now, when he says wrapper, he means like container elements, not uh, like you know, musical performers. Right. That's, that's, that's absolutely correct. Just wanted to clarify that. That's good. That's good. Uh, I was getting confused myself. But basically, if you have a shopping cart, you might want to namespace it like this, SC. So SC dash wrapper could mean uh, that it's the shopping cart wrapper. Uh, so anyway, that's just part of the article. I definitely recommend you read the whole thing, but it's uh, pretty, pretty in-depth and pretty good advice, I, I think, for architecting the CSS of large projects. 
Anyway, that's all we have time for today. I'm, I guess you could say that's a wrap. That that is a wrap. I am at Nick RP on Twitter. And I am at Jay Cypher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out our show notes at youtube.com slash go treehouse or search for us on iTunes. We are the Treehouse Show. And of course, if you'd like to see more videos like this one about web design, web development, mobile business, and so much more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com slash show for a free month of Treehouse. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next week. Thank you.